for invocation. I want to step back uh, four days to 9-11 to uh, reflect on the 19th anniversary of 9-11 when, uh, when we, uh, we lost many members of our, of, of, of our country and, and all the uh, firefighters and police that ran into those buildings to save people. And also to remember 9-12, where we were all united as one to fight what, what, what happened that day. So a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Could we have a roll call, please? Mrs. Costa? Here. Mrs. Hall? Here. Mr. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Mr. Ryder? Here. Mr. Salazar? Here. Mrs. Thurston? Here. Mr. Ungeyer? Here. Chairman Krizel? Here. I would like to present Mr. Ongayer as our newest member. Congratulations and welcome aboard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm humbled and I'm honored to be part of this team and look forward to serving the, the school system, the residents of Enfield, and trying to contribute in, in the best way that I can to make to just make it better. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Move on to number four, superintendent's report, EPS school update, Mr. Dresick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm glad I get to go before all of you because I'm gonna steal some of your thunder. Um, obviously, we're in our second week of school under the hybrid learning plan. And now that we've experienced a week, I can say this proudly, um, that it went much better than I think any of us could have anticipated. Um, going into a hybrid plan in the middle of a pandemic, um, was nothing that we could have ever prepared for um, prior to six months ago. Uh, but all things considered, I first have to take the opportunity to thank our kids. Um, since we opened up last Tuesday, I have only gotten one phone call from a school uh, on a student refusing to wear a mask. So all the concerns that we've had throughout the summer and throughout the spring about the mask enforcement and, and us drilling that into everybody's minds about how important it was to mitigate the risk, um, our kids clearly got the message. And our kids are in some cases better behaved when it comes to mask wearing than a lot of our adults. So I want to thank our students first and foremost. Um, I was also prepared when we go through this process, and I said it all throughout the summer, you know, that we're all new at this, um, and we're trying this for the first time. But I was fully prepared to sit here this, this evening and take responsibility if things had gone bad. Uh, fortunately, they didn't. But I'm also the recipient of a lot of well wishes and thanks and gratitude and praise. Um, and it can't go both ways. And I say that because our smooth transition for the first week of school wasn't something that Andy or I did. It was really a, a testament to, to our staff and to all of our staff, from our administrators who've worked all summer long tirelessly, to all of our teachers, paraprofessionals, our nurses, our cafeteria workers who we cannot forget throughout this entire process have been feeding our kids since, back since March all of our clerical staff members, everybody stepped up to do what they needed to do to make sure that our kids had the absolute best experience as possible. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. The first day of school was weird. I don't know what it looked like on the inside of the buildings as do any of you because we weren't allowed to go. Um, but all the reports back and the feedback I've gotten has all been extremely positive under the circumstances with the hope that someday life will get back to normal but the good news is now we know that if we hopefully never have to experience this again, but if we do, we do know how to do it. That doesn't mean there aren't hurdles, that there aren't daily roadblocks, there are. Um, and I just wanted to use this opportunity to explain some of the misconceptions that may be out there in the public with regards um, to notifications in the event there are positive cases in town. And I say that because I'm sure most of you are getting alerts on your phone every hour, it seems, over the last couple of days about a school system shutting down or a building shutting down or a bus company shutting down. Um, and I know that there have, I've gotten some questions where people have asked, you know, how come I haven't heard anything about Enfield? If you don't hear anything about Enfield, that's good news. Um, but I also wanna sort of sure up what the communication protocol will be. Although it's in the document, sometimes we've learned is saying these things verbally to the community carries a little bit more weight. 
in the event, and there's a, there's a lot of, and, it, and I understand because it was confusing to me and I was appointed to do all this since the spring. Um, and having daily conversations with our director of public health, um, there are different terminologies that you'll hear as we start going deeper into the school year. And one of the most common is a contact of a contact. And what does that mean? And that simply means that if you know someone who has been in contact with a confirmed positive case, that direct contact, and I'll, I'll use myself as just an example, um, if it was someone in my home that was tested positive, I'm a direct contact. Now, logic would say that I would then notify everybody I have been in contact with since that determination was made. That's not necessarily the case because anyone who was in contact with me would be classified as a contact of a contact. And under the guidance and under all of the, the Department of Public Health regulations, notifications of contacts of contacts are not required at this point in time. It's not until you become a direct contact yourself then we have to initiate contact tracing. So if that doesn't mean we haven't had people who have potentially been exposed or may know someone who was exposed, but until that person is actually in direct contact with someone who has tested positive, as well as in contact with folks in the school community, we don't have to start that contact tracing pro protocol as well as the notification to the entire community, to the schools, et cetera. What we've also seen and you know we've been and again I'm I'm pretty superstitious so I'm I'm not trying to dodge anything but I'm not going to be overtly saying things because I don't want to jinx anything. Um, but you have seen surrounding districts that have had to close for a period of time. The the main reason that districts are closing is not just to do a cleansing of the buildings. It's because of that contact tracing process. Because if they are find out if a district is notified that there's a potential case in their district. Uh, or there's a, I'm sorry, a confirmed case in their district, the contact tracing protocol begins. And if you can't get a hold of every person that could possibly be within that stratosphere, that would require you to shut a building down or shut a cohort down or shut a particular grade down. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to shut the entire school down. That decision, unfortunately, is still left locally and that would ultimately be, ultimately be my decision. So in the event we did have a confirmed positive case in our schools and we weren't able to contact trace in an appropriate amount of time to bring people back, that may require us to either shut a building down, shut a cohort down. And one of the things I wanted to make clear this evening is some of the districts that you've heard that have had cases that they've had to shut and isolate particular buildings, the dynamics of those districts are different than we are. We have a lot of transient population between our schools, not just necessarily with staff. We're doing everything we can to isolate staff to their own bubbles of their buildings. But as all of you very well know, we have a lot of siblings throughout this, this community and different levels of schools between our primary, intermediate, middle, and high school. So it's all gonna be case specific. In the event there is a positive case, we will initiate this contact tracing protocols immediately. I can assure you for anyone watching at home, we're not taking this lightly. Um, Andy and I have spent the better part of the last 72 hours um, getting to know much more about people in the community than we ever thought we wanted to, with particularly asking them when they became symptomatic, who they've been in contact with, where they could have been, have they been to their doctor, what, are they getting tested? All of that information we gather at our level, and then I, in, in turn, share that information with our Director of Public Health and she advises on whether or not there's any necessary next steps that I have to take. You know, fortunately, we're at the point now where we're still information gathering and we haven't had to take further action, but we have had to ask people to remain home. Staff members, students, even though it's not necessarily, and I also have to be careful because we are still dealing with HIPAA issues. This is a public health issue and these are people's health. So I know people are anxious and families are anxious and believe me, I, I, the anxiety is in my home as well. Um, you want to know more information, but we have to be very cognizant about what we can share with the public in the event there is a, a potential case in our district. So I just wanted people to understand. I think there was an anticipation that if there was a case anywhere in town, that you, know, you would get a robocall from me that, that evening saying there's a case here and this is what we're doing. That's not necessarily how the process works. Uh, and the decision on that process is not necessarily ours. That's all the guidance that's been shared with us thus far. So I'm hopeful that you don't get a robocall from me anytime soon. 
um, that the smooth opening that I was reported in the paper that I shared continues on until we move on to our next phase. But I wanted to make sure that everyone understood the communication portion of it. It's not that we don't want to communicate with the public. Um, we are limited as to what we can share, but I can assure you that because you're not hearing anything from us, doesn't mean that we haven't essentially spent 20 hours a day on the phone with families or staff members or each other or the health department at all hours of the night. I'm gonna open a tree something, something very, very valuable when this is all over for taking my calls at 11 o'clock on a Sunday evening. But um, I, I do wanna take this opportunity not just to thank her, but also thank all of our staff members who have been forthright and our parents who have been forthright. I, I can't stress this enough for staff, for, for, and particularly for parents. And we saw this unfortunately in another district. If you are sick or you're showing any symptoms, please stay home. There are no perfect attendance awards any longer. You're not gonna get a pat on the back if you come to school every day anymore. Quite honestly, we want you here, but I want you here safely. And I want, I want, we want you here to make sure that you're not carrying something that you may not be aware of. There was a case in another community where a student got tested, got sent to school prior to the results coming back in. And then the results came in, student was positive, and then the district had to make, make adjustments and, and shut down particular buildings. We don't wanna be, it's for everyone's best interest to please, if you are showing any symptoms, and the symptoms are all, the, the list of symptoms are everywhere. Our websites, the individual websites, PTO websites, I'm sure, uh, you know, fever, we all know what they are by now. If you have any symptoms, Please keep your child home. If you work for us, please stay home and just let us know. What we're doing is we're at the monitoring stage. So if someone reports that they're having symptoms, we have contact with them and then we follow up to make sure that the symptoms either dissipate or if testing is required so that we, we wanna know on the onset so that way, even if nothing has to be done, it will assist us in the event it comes to a contact tracing environment where if we get notified today on Tuesday of potential symptoms and that case ultimately results in a positive test, we could start the contact tracing now you know, internally so that way when we formally have to do it, we can expedite the contact tracing, isolate who needs to be isolated and get the kids back in school quicker. So it, it, it's, a, it's a public service announcement for everyone out there. Please, I understand this is an a very anxious time for everyone. For the most part, our families have been fantastic. We're, you know, we are, it's careful what you wish for. I say that and then I'll, you know, just today we're getting, it's, it's September in Connecticut. Kids are gonna have fevers that are unrelated to this. Kids are gonna have allergies. Kids are gonna be going through masks because they keep sneezing on it, but because they have a pollen allergy. There's a lot of things out there, um, but we have to treat every single case as if it's the worst and then hope for the best from there. For, so, so that we can ultimately keep everybody safe and keep everybody in school as long as we can. So I, I, I thank you for paying attention to that. If you have any questions, the protocols are, we're asking everyone to notify their principals first and the principals notify Andy and I right away and we start that process going. Hopefully that's the last time I have to say it and everything goes even smoother from here on out, but I wanted to take this opportunity since so many folks in town tune into these meetings just as a, as a reminder. Um, I can't stress enough. Everything that we're doing is with the health and safety of our kids and our staff members in mind. There's going to be decisions down the road that may not be popular with everyone. I certainly understand that. No one ever asked to be put in a position where we have to make these decisions. But the core of what we believe in, in taking care of our kids, is, is going to remain at the forefront of every decision that I'm required to make, including our staff. So everything that we do it's going to be with the health and safety of our kids in mind as our highest priority. And I just want to assure parents that, you know, we've got 5,000 kids in this district. None of them have my last name, but I treat them all as if they're my own. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I have the same confidence in where my children are. So I think that's just important for parents to know that everybody who's working in this district is treating their kids as if they're their own and trying to make sure that we keep them as safe as possible. Um, I've already said stay home. I'm going to say it again. I implore you. Any symptoms, if you have a runny nose, stay home. We're, we're, the, the digital piece has been going much smoother than we anticipated, and, and my barometer is pretty low for that. We're not Miami or Hartford, so we did, we did great. Um, we didn't get hacked, and the whole thing didn't get shut down. So thank you, Mr. Barassa and, and, Ms., and Ms. Wiley, Dr. Wiley, for 
all of your work. There are still roadblocks. So putting 5,000 kids online at the same time, there were going to be hiccups. We knew that. Um, but fortunately, we have a system in place where we're addressing them in real time, and our staff has gone above and beyond to make sure that everybody who needs assistance is getting it with the goal of everybody working as smoothly as we can. And my last thing is not related, and I know Mr. Cruzel, you mentioned this in the invocation, um, but last week on Friday was the 19th anniversary of 9-11, uh, and I don't want to take away what you would share with the community, but I want to once again highlight the work um, that one of our longtime friends has been doing for a number of years, and that's Lori Gates, um, with, the with the gratitude for our first responders. And for, even during a pandemic, um, if you recall in previous years, she shared with, with, with the board in the town, um, having kids submit letters to thank our first responders here in Enfield for their service. Um, and she reached out to me over the summer and, and put together a digital program. There's actually a link to a YouTube video that we can share with the community and put up on our website. Um, but what a, Mrs. Gates is, is, is one of the treasures of this community, not just with this, but with Reads Across America and everything she does for Enfield Hoorah. So I wanted to take this opportunity to, to sincerely thank her for, for everything that she's done and I know that she'll continue to do. That concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Gates, for doing that. So I need a motion to suspend the rules and take number 6A out of order and, and proceed uh, proceed with it now. So moved. Moved by Ms. Hall, seconded by Ms. Costa. Any discussion? Just show of hands. All in favor? I got all nine. Okay. So we will proceed with 6A, approval of the 2020-21 School Readiness Grant application. And we have with us Ms. Morales. Mr. Dresick, would you like to introduce her? Sure. Welcome, Ms. Morales. <laughs> uh, tonight we want to invite uh, Amy Morales to talk to us about our School Readiness Grant. Most of you know runs uh, the Family Resource Center in town and in our school, so I don't want to mess anything else up, so I'm going to turn it over to Amy now I can see it. Hi, everyone. Thank you. So I am, the, as Mr. Jezik said, I'm the Family Resource Center coordinator, but I'm here tonight in my role as the school readiness liaison for the town of Enfield. Um, there are 28 school readiness slots that are funded by the Office of Early Childhood for preschool age children, and these are housed at the Enfield Child Development Center at Stowe. So the grant application that Mr. Dresick will sign along with the town manager is for continuation of funding for this grant from September through June. Um, you signed off on it last year, and this is just a continuation of the, the grant for preschool at ECDC. Okay, so I need a motion to approve the 2020-21, or no, we already did that, didn't we? No, that no. I need a motion to approve the 2020-21 school readiness grant application. So moved. Moved by Ms. Hall, seconded by Mr. Salazar. Or Mr. Ryder, sorry, Mr. Ryder. So any questions for Ms. Morales? Any discussion? I don't see any hands. So we need a roll call vote, please. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Four. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Salazar? Four. Mrs. Thurston? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Morales, for joining. And if you want to stay on, you may. But if you want, you can enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, so I need, an, I need another motion to suspend the rules and take number 12, executive session, uh, out of order. So moved. Moved by Ms. Costa. Second. Second by Ms. Hall. Any discussion? Show of hands, all in favor? We have everybody in favor. Executive session 
for a discussion of a client attorney client privilege communication regarding petition received by district. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Hall, seconded by Second. Mr. LeBlanc. Any discussion? Show of hands, all in favor. We have nine in favor, zero against. We are now in executive session.
We are back from executive session. We will continue our agenda now at 5A, approve policy number 6141.329, one-to-one tablet program, second reading. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Hall. Second. Second by Ms. Thurston. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mrs. Costa? Four. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Four. Mrs. LeBlanc? Four. Mr. Ryder? Four. Mr. Salazar? Four. Mrs. Thurston? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Motion passes. We are moving now to 6B, action regarding attorney-client privilege. And for this business, I am recusing myself from this, from this uh, business. So I'm passing it on to Ms. Costa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to make a motion that the board deny the request for a hearing under section 10-238 of the Connecticut General Statutes regarding the matters set forth in the petition received by the town clerk on September 1st, 2020, and certified by the town clerk on September 8th, 2020, on the ground that the petition does not set forth a question requiring a hearing under section 10-238, because the petition requests that an individual member of the board resign from the board, which is a matter resting solely within the discretion of that individual board member and over which the board does not have authority or control. Do I have a second? I didn't get that. Could you try? Mr. Salazar, second. Uh, roll call vote. Mrs. Costa? Four. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Abstain. Mrs. LeBlanc? No. Mr. Ryder? No. Mr. Salazar? Four. Mrs. Thurston? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We move to board member comments. Before we start comments, I just want to bring everyone up to speed as soon as I find it with the addition of Mr. Ungeyer as our board member, there's been a few changes to our standing committees. The uh, finance committee will have uh, Wendy Costa as chair, John Ungeyer, Tina LeBlanc, and myself and Joyce Hall as alternates. The policy committee will have Bill Salazar as chair, John Ungeyer, Scott Ryder, Jonathan LeBlanc as an alternate, Tina LeBlanc as an alternate. The only, oh, the other change is curriculum committee will have Jonathan LeBlanc as the chair, Bill Salazar, Joyce Hall, Wendy Costa as an alternate, Stacey Thurston as an alternate. And the joint uh, BOE security committee will have Jonathan LeBlanc, John Ungeyer, and Scott Ryder. And I believe that's the only changes. And you will get an updated list at the end of the week with your updates from Miss from Kathy. So we will start with Mr. Ryder first. No, I just uh, to clarify, uh, will uh, Mr. Ungeyer have an adoptive school responsibility? That was also new. Oh, oh. yes, and he's taking over JFK. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, I just so, wanted to let my PTO know for the record. Yeah, so Mr. Mr. Ryder, your first communication. Um. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll try to keep it brief. Um, I wanted to pose something to think about in favor of maintaining the hybrid schedule that I hadn't thought of until I spoke to a bunch of teachers as the uh, school year started this year and the few days leading up to it where um, we were doing a few things, welcoming back the staff as a PTO dad, et cetera. Um, what I was getting feedback from was the size of the classes as most teachers at least K through five have about say seven to nine children Mondays and Tuesdays 
We're distance learning on Wednesdays and another seven to nine kids on Thursdays and Fridays. That this is a unique opportunity for a 10 to one or less ratio that even if our kids are only going two days a week, that a lot of the staff gave me the feedback that they could actually do more one-on-one -on -one with these seven to nine kids in 12 hours over two days than they could if they had 20 over five. And I hadn't thought of it like that. So I think obviously science should make the decisions and, and make the scores and we'll go back when it's safe and all that. But I, I just thought that was a great way for students that missed three or four months of school in the spring to get caught up. Um, because, you know, with Mrs. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so teaching these grades, we can actually get the kids caught back up and then right back on track with the grade they're in now. Um, so I just thought that was a unique perspective. And I know it's not the easiest for families or for teachers that have to teach in person and to their classroom, but I, I did appreciate that perspective. So for those, you know, steadfast, I have to go back five days a week tomorrow. It, it, it is something to consider. And I, and I hope that everybody does. And, uh, and we'll get back when we can. And I know that 2020, 20, slash 2021 is a blip on the radar and we're all doing our best. And on that note, I wanted to thank the teachers again. Um, they are pulling double and triple duty in some cases. Um, again, having less students in front of them helps with that, but it's, it's not ideal. And I wanted to thank them. I've been watching over my kids' shoulders, um, both in fourth and seventh grade um, and the staff at Eli Whitney and JFK and to all of our school buildings. I just wanted to say thank you to the staff for that. I hope everybody stays safe. Um, and that we don't have this back in Enfield and that we don't get shut down again because that's obviously the worst case scenario for everybody involved. Um, but I did want to bring that perspective to everybody's attention on the board because uh, I know not everybody has had a chance at the schools or to talk with teachers or to talk with the kids. Um, I want to reiterate what Mr. Dresick said earlier, uh, a couple hours back, um, if you have any symptoms, stay home, please. Uh, we all have the iPads now. It's it's not as crucial that you go on Monday, even if your last name starts with a B. You can learn from home, um, just like the kids, uh, L through Z. Um, you can just sign in. And if you're not feeling great and you want to sign in for an hour here and there, you, you do your best. Um, and hopefully there's no snow days with these iPads either. Um, I do hope soon that we can meet in person again. Um, I was told that that could be as soon as the second meeting in September, which would be our next meeting. Um, and I'm just curious how that will work. If anybody knows yet, please keep us in the loop, keep the communications open between all of us. So we how that's gonna happen. And if we do meet in person, how we can get the public's input um, besides their emails, that would be great. Um, and again, just wanted to thank all the staff members and thank the kids. Um, the masks are going great. And speaking of masks, when Mr. Longy can get me his contact on those awesome green soft cloth EPS masks, I'd like to get some more made. So Mr. Longy, hit me up because um, I have some PTOs interested in offering those as a fundraiser, et cetera. Um, I know we've been talking about it. We've all been busy reopening the schools, but I have let the PTOs know that we've already had discussions about it and hope we'll have some more information soon. So thank you again to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Then I'll jump to the other side, Mr. LeBlanc. Um, let me see. Uh, I just wanted to start out by saying um, just it's an outright shame that the CIAC and the Department of Public Health uh, have been putting our football kids through the situation of what they're currently in of no football, football, no football. I mean, yeah, it, it sucks for these kids. Um, and that falls solely on the Department of Public Health and the CIAC for no zero communication between the two. And here we are, September 14th, 15th, and it's all up in the air still. Um, just shameful, outright shameful. Uh, I watch, you know, these other states, and not only are they playing football, they got the cheerleaders, they got the fans, and I don't know, must break our kids' hearts to see that. And we can't even figure out how to get our football players on the field. So, and if there is some kind of ultimate decision, which right now it looks like there's, they're leaning towards no football, uh, I think there should be some kind of clarification between 
the whether it's the Department of Public Health, CIA, whoever it falls under, to come out and say what the clarifications are between the different sports. Because uh, it's not just me. I've heard from others too, or who are, you know, under the same kind of impression. What's what's the difference between soccer or football? I mean, soccer, you're you're bumping into each other, you're sweating on each other, possibly spitting on each other, or saliva, but. So I don't know why football is being singled out the way it is, especially, you know, I think there's, there's ways around it, but I, I just think, you know, let the kids play. I've always been a big proponent of that and uh, I'll continue to say it. So I hope at some point there's a uh, football at the high school. Um, besides that, just uh, last night was really cool um, with the JFK groundbreaking. It was good to see all of you um, or most of you in person again. Um, it's been a long time. And maybe now that the groundbreaking's happened, maybe sometime in the in the next few meetings or a couple meetings, we could get Randy Daigle back and uh, have him give us a kind of an update on where things stand now that that's you know back at the forefront of people's minds and whatnot. So, but it, you know, from being on the outside looking in, and I mean the the amount of work that's gone into it already is incredible, and uh, I think come 2022, it's going to be a really really good thing for our community. So. Yeah, that's it for me tonight. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Ms. Thurston. Um, I just wanted to thank the teachers and the students um, for, you know, coming back and everything and just all their hard work they put into it. And I have to say that I know some of the kids that are at JFK are keeping the teachers on their toes regarding social distancing and making sure that the teachers are making sure the students are the six feet apart. Um, so I'm very proud of the kids that they're, you know, keeping an eye on that as well. And just, you know, wish everybody a good year. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Thurston. Mr. Salazar. I don't have any comments this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Ms. Hall. I have a couple of questions for Superintendent Dredd. Um, when we were discussing how the school would reopen and all, buses were a topic with the feeling that we could not follow through on having bus monitors because there weren't any available. How is the busing going and is the loading and unloading working as plan uh yes and yes the but actually i in my list of thank yous at the beginning i forgot to thank all of our friends at smith bus um the funny bus monitors was impossible uh, we had to go in a lot of cases without um but it's been as as seamless as we can possibly think and a lot of that again goes to what i said originally about our kids understanding and, and getting it and following the rules um so it, it has gone gone very well with regards to our, our busing situation and also with the change in arrival and dismissal times being altered a little bit, um, it seems to be working pretty well right now. Now, that said, we still only have less than 50% of the population in the building at once, so that's working now. Um, I do envision if we do go back to a, a full schedule again that our bus ridership will remain low. So we're gonna have, that's something we're keeping our eye on with regards to traffic flow at all the buildings. But so far, yes, yeah, so good. Second question, um, they've recently announced that three-year-olds and four-year-olds will be required to be wearing masks. And I don't believe that was part of our early childhood development system. Will we have to do that and do that you have the masks for them? Are you sure Ms. Valley didn't reach out to you before you got that question? Because I... Mr. Ryan. No, I, I have not talked to Jackie <laughs> I'm at not, all. I'm, I'm kidding, Joyce. Um, yeah, we actually are working with the same vendor who got us these masks um, to provide more custom story learning center masks for our three and four year olds is there as well. We don't have them currently, um, but we're working on trying to get them as quickly as we can. Because it was quite a surprise to hear it in the news today that that was going to happen because it was a significant change from what they'd originally started. And within an hour, um, I think we had an order ready to go. <laughs> on top of things, great. Um, the 
Distance Learning Center has opened and ERFC is successfully conducting our daily activities. Um, they had not, as of this week, reached that goal of having 50 subscribers, but they're anticipating that they'll have more than 50 beginning next week based on the applications that they've received. And apparently everything thus far is going well. They, um, the majority of the parents are enrolling for three days. And um, I, that is primarily the information. They've also been able to secure some funding for free and reduced launches. So their low rate, which was $35 a day, has now been reduced to 25. The other, other rates remain the same. Um, and there are openings nonetheless, because they are planned to have up as many as 150. The minimum requirement was 50. They expect to exceed that on the third week in operation. So things are going well. That's my report for today. Thank you, Ms. Hall. And while she mentioned Stowe, I just want to show you, isn't that a cute eaglet? <laughs> eaglet, yes. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the Stowe earlier on a set of eaglet. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that and I just got a kick out of that. So thank you, Jackie, for coming up with that. So He has a name, or she has a name. <laughs> its name is Selk. Selk. Let's move on to our new member, Mr. Ungeyer. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I really don't have much to say other than that um, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and appreciative to be provided this opportunity to serve on this important board. Um, and I'd like to ask my fellow board members um, for your patience and, and your help as I work to, to get up to speed. So um, just a very appreciative and look forward very much to working with you all. Thank you, Mr. Ungar. Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna welcome uh, John Ungar to our board. Welcome to our Board of Ed family. Um, thank you for wanting to do this. It's not always an easy job, um, but welcome. Um, I had the privilege to work with Lori on the Board of Ed uh, for a term, and um, so welcome. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, a few people. Uh, this year, um, the first day of school was so different as we prepped. And some of us um, prepped for two days of school. We prepped for the first day of school of remote learning, and we prepped for the first day of school of in-person learning. Um, so it was a kind of an exciting week because it was from one to one. Um, but um, here, um, my MPL High student, um, it went seamlessly um, remotely. Um, there was a little bit of anxiety on my part when it was about to be 736 and he had to join his first period class. Um, with that being said, um, I'm very thankful to the Enfield High staff. Um, they have been extremely helpful in making sure that people are logged on and being taken care of. Um, I want to thank the students um, for their patience as we work through this and the bus drivers who have been amazing. Um, through this as well. And um, I just would like to give a shout out for Mr. Carlson. He works in the MPL High Guidance Department. Um, he is amazing. He, he spent some time um, getting my son's schedule right and setting up a plan for for even uh, next year for, for when he's a senior. Um, let me see. I think that's all I have for tonight. Um, Welcome back to school, everyone. Um, let's say safe, uh, socially distanced, and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Costa. Yep, uh, just really quickly. Um, sorry, I had to miss the JFK groundbreaking last night, um, but I was out of state on a family emergency for two weeks and I need to do my two weeks of self-quarantining, which will end tomorrow, thank God. 
Um, and the only other thing is, um, you know, congrats and thanks to everybody for the great start we had for the school year. Um, I've heard great things from the kids. They're so excited to be back, even if it is only two days a week. Um, I've heard great things from the parents in terms of the improvements in the distance learning um, and how different it is than, you know, as we promised it would be very different than it was in the spring. They're very pleased with it. So um, let's hope we can keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. I only have a few comments. One, the JFK groundbreaking went excellent last night. Thank you to Chairman Daigle, Vice Chairman Stritch, and the rest of the committee for all their work, to the to the CMR Gil Bain, to the architect JCJ, and the owner rep CSG. I don't know how I keep all those initials in my head. But um, thank you all for all the hard work and all the subcontractors that are working hard over there. And they've got to jump on it with us being out of school since March. So they are right now ahead of schedule that I know of and, and under budget at this point. So knock on wood, we keep that up like we did with the high school because I know this is Enfield and that's what we do. So, and with that, I will turn it, I will turn it over to the next board member, uh, board committee reports. Number eight, curriculum, Mr. Salazar. For now. We have, yeah, we have, we have not had a uh, meeting since the last board meeting. Um, and, uh, as we discussed earlier, the chairmanship is going to be passing over to uh, to Mr. LeBlanc. And I believe you have a meeting coming up this this week, correct, Mr. Mr. LeBlanc? Uh, Thursday night, yeah. Okay. Finance, Miss Costa. Hey, yep, the finance committee met um, last night virtually um and we will have our certification reports later but we you know looked at where we were for the new budget as well as looking at the end of the year at financials all's good policy mr salazar we also have not had a meeting since the last board meeting but i believe we have a meeting scheduled for the following week for next tuesday i believe yes leadership we have none Joint facilities uh, met and had a presentation on the um, on the master plan for the different buildings in town, and that will be coming up to the council soon. And we also had a presentation on the, the roof plan, seeing that we will not have a referendum for roofs this year, which we were trying to get, but with the COVID and everything else, we just they just the council couldn't agree to uh, do one. And we're supposed to have an update on the um, on the um, transfer station as well. So stay tuned. Uh, JFK Building Committee again met last week. They are meeting on a bi biweekly basis, and they're just uh, approving things. Oh, with this, they are going to meet this Thursday to approve something to approve something with uh, furniture again or technology that has to go to the state. Um, I will keep you posted. We may need to have a special meeting next week to approve that so they could go to the state. I will find out. Oh, I'll try to find out before Thursday if that's the case and let you guys know. Uh, Joint Security had a meeting and we discussed uh, uh, the things about uh, security of the buildings. And they're not meeting again for another quarter. Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Ms. Hall. Does the Joint Security Committee also consider cybersecurity? I don't believe so. And with things like ransomware attacking Hartford school system, it does seem as though somewhere yeah. in the we must have that discussion. I believe that's an IT question. We, we discussed that at, at our ITPC meeting. Okay. Yeah, joint, security, joint security is more brick and mortar. Yes. Uh, school reopening. I we have it on here, but at this point, it's a mute issue. We opened, so. But I think we'll I think we'll leave the committee there just in case we we the worst thing happens. So we'll just keep that committee going for now until this whole COVID thing is over. 
joint insurance. Uh, I did try to find out if we have a meeting in October, and I haven't got a response yet. So any other committees that I know of? None. So let's move on to approval of minutes, special board of ed meeting minutes, August 25th, 2020. So moved. Moved by Ms. Thurston, seconded by Ms. Hall. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. We have nine in favor, zero against. Number 10, approval of counts and payroll for the month of August, 2020, Ms. Costa. Okay, um, the Finance Committee met via team portal on September 14th, 2020 to review financial statements for the month of August year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of August, total expenditures amount to $3,072,040.85 broken down between payroll totaling $1,962,254.84 and other accounts totaling $1,109,786.01. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are <coughs> documented. Motion Costa, seconded by Ms. Hall. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. I see nine hands, nine in favor, zero against. Ms. Costa. Certification of grants and head start expenditures. The finance committee met via team portal on September 14th, 2020 to review financial statements for grants during the month of August year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded there is nothing significant to report to the board. I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of August, the total grant and Head Start expenditures amount to $141,813.47, broken down between payroll totaling $111,075.70 and other accounts totaling $30,737.77. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Second. Motion by Ms. Costa, seconded by Ms. Thurston. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor, raise your hand. I see nine hands, nine in favor, zero against. No line item transfers, I'm assuming? No line item transfers. Number 11, correspondence communications. No, not tonight. So just so we know, there's 14 people watching on YouTube. Uh, number 12, we did already. Number 13, Mr. motion Chair, to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion by Ms. Thurston, seconded by Mr. Salazar. Any, uh, any discussion? No. All in favor? Yes. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. And thank you, ETV. Thank you, Guy, for all your, for all your work.